Hello, everyone. Welcome to our worship service here on our YouTube channel. I hope that you've had a good and wonderful week. And um, for all of us here in the Needville Independent School District, I hope that if you have kids that are in the school systems, their last week of school was a successful one. And for all of you that are teachers and or administrators or any other part of the school system, I hope that you enjoyed your first weekend off. Um, I know that the school year is always, uh, it, when it comes to an end, it's always uh, a, a rush, mad rush to the end, to the finish. Um, but thank God you have all made it through. Um, for some of you, this was your last time to be in, your t in, a, t in a teaching capacity uh, or in an administrative capacity. You, you may be retiring this year. Um, for a number of you, it's probably just another year and looking forward to the next one. But uh, good news is you've got a few, you got a couple months to just kind of relax, get your spirit back, get your breath and get your energy back. Um, but know that we give thanks to everything that you have done over this past year for all of our kids and for all of the kids. I'm glad that it's finally summer and I hope that they have a wonderful beginning to the summer. The other thing I do want to say is because this is Memorial Day weekend, I want to say a big thank you and honor all of those who have given the ultimate sacrifice for us to be able to do what we do, to live in this country, to be free, and to be able to live the lives that we live today, simply because there were men and women that were willing to give up their own lives so that the rest of us might live in peace and in harmony and in freedom. So I want to give a big thank you um, to all of those uh, family members that are still living, that are living with that hole in them, that missing piece, whether it be a father, mother, sister, brother, husband, wife, whatever the case may be. And there are so many um, that we want to give thanks to th this day. Um, for everything that they did, for the sacrifice that they made so that our nation and so that we as individuals could live the way that we do. And so I do want to spend a few seconds and give a moment of silence for all of those who have given that ultimate sacrifice. Uh, we will do this in the service, uh, in both services in the sanctuary, but I also wanted to do it here on our YouTube channel. So please, Spend a few moments with me here and be in silence as we lift up our thanks and our gratitude towards all of those men and women who gave their lives so that we can live the way that we do. Let us go into a silent time of silent prayer now. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, let us begin our worship service together by singing. Uh, we're going to open with our hymn, number 451, Be Thou My Vision. Let us sing together. Amen. 
Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32 through 49. Hear the words of the Old Testament this morning. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. And so Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and he tried in vain to walk for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. And so David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Will you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for this time to be together, this time to worship together, and this ability to do so in such an interesting and wonderful way here on our channel. Father, we just pray that through this medium, we would be able to fellowship together and worship together, not only our spirits combining and connecting, but all of our spirits combining, connecting with you and your spirit. And so, Father, we just ask that your spirit would come into us, no matter where we are listening to this video, no matter if we're in our cars, or our dining rooms, our living rooms, wherever we are listening to this, let your spirit come into our hearts and change us, break our ears open so that we might hear your words for your people being spoken in this video. And we pray all of this in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. So let me start out this morning by saying, who doesn't love an underdog story? A good underdog story, right? Just go and Google underdog movies and you will find hundreds of movies based on that premise alone. Rather, the underdog is picked on and the top dog is a jerk like in the Karate Kid with the bullies from Cobra Kai, or the underdog is just some average Joe who shouldn't make it, but through grit and determination somehow does, like in Rudy. No matter which underdog you think about, the whole story hinges on one thing, the audience falling in love with the spirit and tenacity of the underdog to defy the odds, overcome immense adversity, and succeed when everything is on the line. But as Christians, it's actually much more than just loving a story or falling in love with a character. Our faith teaches us that the underdog story is the faith story. 
It's the, the underdog story has a deep significance to the story of faith. Uh, as uh, a, a good theologian and, and pastor, Philip Yancey, once said, I cannot help but conclude that though the world may be twil- tilted toward the rich and powerful, God is tilted towards the underdog. Today, we're going to continue looking at the life and times of David and Samuel, although today we're going to focus on David, because we're going to focus on one of the most iconic stories of all of King David's entire life, the battle with Goliath. Maybe not the first underdog story of the Bible, but it certainly is the first one that normally comes to people's minds. A literal giant versus a young boy. The artistic depictions abound that attempt to capture the innocence and infantile youthfulness of David versus the grizzled, battle-worn behemoth named Goliath. It's a story that's so easy to understand, we teach it almost in its complete entirety to children, because the message is so universal and so simple that even babes in the faith can grasp it. And that is, if you have God on your side, there is nothing that you cannot accomplish. When I read the story of David and Goliath, I'm always taken aback at how calm and collected David is throughout the whole premise. I mean, we understand the, the idea that David, a young child, a young boy, even if he has been anointed by Sam, Samuel at this point, he's still a young boy, is, fa- is looking up at a Philistine that is a giant. Remember the story tells us that Goliath, when he steps forth and challenges the Israelite army, he did this weeks before David showed up. And what has happened? The entirety of the Israelite army is so scared of him that none of them dare to take a step forward to go and fight him. You know, have you, have you ever seen those? Uh, usually they happen in, in comedy routines where uh, the leader will stand up and say, who's willing to do this for me? Anyone who's willing to take a step forward. And everyone takes a step back except for that one guy that wasn't really paying attention. All of a sudden the leader turns back around and says, ah, you volunteered yourself. Well, the Israelite army, the same thing happens. Saul says, okay, who's going to fight this Philistine for me? And when he turns back around, no one's moved. As a matter of fact, everyone's moved backwards. No one wants to fight Goliath. No one thinks that they have any chance against that guy. And so they've all been completely subdued by their own fear. His strength, his stature, his experience, he was death personified for the Israelite army. And yet David stands, steps forward and goes, I'll fight him. And he does so calm as you like. Fearless is probably the most appropriate word for it, but at some level, it really doesn't seem to do what David says and does justice because it wasn't just the fact that he was fearless. He steps forward and says, I, not only am I going to take him on, but I'm going to win. Now, you can chalk it up to the being to David being a cocky teenager all you want, because we all know that teenagers happen to have that cockiness streak in them, right? But the fact is, is that if David were only thinking of himself, if his only goal and his only thought process was that teenage cockiness, then he wouldn't have said that he did this so that no one's heart would fail. Now, actually, the better translation for this, because we know the ancient Israelites, their word for heart was actually not just a place of emotion. For them, the heart was the place that your soul rested. That was where your faith was. So actually, the better translation of this is that David does this so that no one's faith would fail. He didn't want them to lose their faith in God. And so he says, I will step forward and I will prove to everyone around here that it's God that's in charge. Not me, not you, not the Philistine, it's God. And David also lays out why he's so calm to Saul. When he does what I have said numerous times in different sermons here and there, and I will continue to say when you're doing your prayers, recount all that God has already done for you. Not just the things that God has done for the world. Yes, we want to give him thanks for those things, but I want you to focus on the things he's done for you personally. 
David, when David talks to Saul, he doesn't go back to Exodus. He doesn't go back to Abraham. Instead, he goes back to just a few weeks before his personal life, his personal experience, his personal testimony. He shares how God protected him and his flock out in the wilderness from predatory animals like lions and bears. David proves through his own testimony that he trusts God, not just because it's suppo you're supposed to, but because he has proof that God not only exists, but he takes care of his promised. He also knows that because God is greater than everything, that size doesn't matter. When he looks on Goliath, he looks and says, but my God's bigger than that. My God's stronger than that. My God has more experience than that. When David looks on Goliath, he doesn't look on him with the eyes of a soldier. He looks on him as with the eyes of one who knows God. And if you want proof as this is the way that he sees Goliath, all you have to do is read the rest of the passage because you see how David speaks with Saul and with Goliath. Notice that there is not a single point in this entire story that David says, I'm going to win. Now, not because he doesn't think he's going to win. He says it, but when he does, he says, God will deliver him into my hands. Now, notice how that's different from saying, I'm going to beat him versus God's going to deliver him into my hands. David already knows that if he succeeds, and I don't, don't get me wrong, David has full faith that he's going to succeed simply because he knows that God's the one that called him. But he said, he thinks even if, that if I succeed, it isn't because of my own strength. It isn't because of my own prowess or my own experience or anything else. It is because God ordained for Goliath to lose to me that's why I win. And that's what I'm going to tell everyone else. God is going to be the one who beats Goliath, not me. David knows that he's not the one that beats Goliath. God will beat Goliath. David knows this. And even though the rest of the world, even though the rest of the army will flock to David and say, David, what a great shot with a slingshot. David, you were, per you were perfect, great accuracy. You picked the right stone, all this stuff. David knows, and he will continue to say, that the slingshot and the well-placed rock were not his doing. David knows that the slingshot released at the perfect time because God ordained it to be such. God, David knows that the rock flew to the exact right spot and sunk exactly the, same, the right amount into his forehead for him to die because God made sure that the rock went to the right place. It had nothing to do with David. It had everything to do with God, and he knows this. And in this kind of statement, in these words, David shows us the picture perfect view of being a humble servant of God. Now, note that I say this that he is the per picture perfect version of humbleness. And not once did David back down. Not once did David say, well, I'll let someone else take care of it. Not once does David slink back and wait for someone else to call him up. No, he stands up and stands firm and says, I will do this because God calls me to do so. I will step forward. I will be the one in that, that has faith and trust in God that he will take care of me and he will do what he needs to do through me. David is strong in his convictions and in his faith to know that God called him to this task. Ask. But he shows humility in saying over and over and over and over again that he was go that he was going to do nothing, but God was going to do things through him. Now, have you ever noticed that Christ does the same thing? We call Christ humble. He even says he is humble. But when we look at some of the things that he says, the teachings that he has, and the ways that he talks to the Sanhedrin and the and, and the Pharisees and Sadducees and so many people, the fact of the matter is he is very far from the traditional understanding of humble. But there is not a single person, whether they are Christian or atheist, really, even if they are enemies of Christ, none of them will tell you that he wasn't humble. Why? It's because no matter what he did, the miracles he performed, the lessons that he taught, whatever he does, do you notice how every time he does something, he turns everything back to God? He turns it back to his father. 
You see, humility isn't about being silent or being in the shadows or being behind the scenes. Sometimes it is, but not all the time. Humility can be in the forefront, just like Christ was leading the pack, just like David was stepping out onto that battlefield with Goliath. Because humility isn't about whether it's in the forefront or in the background. What it is, it's when the person that the spotlight, that everyone is shining the spotlight on in David's sense, they're all looking at David after he wins. In Christ's world, everyone's looking to Christ because he's the one that's teaching. He's the one doing the miracles. It's what they do with that spotlight. David takes that spotlight and turns it back to God and says, I didn't kill Goliath. God did. I didn't throw, I didn't do anything special. I just did what God told me to do. And God took care of the rest. Praise him, honor him, look to him. And what does Christ do? He does the exact same thing. He says, don't look at me because your, your child was raised from the dead. Look to God. Don't look at me because your blindness is taken care of. Look to God. Don't, don't think that these words are coming from my lips. They are coming from God through me. When the spotlight gets shown on them, the humble person shines the spotlight back on the one that actually does the stuff. Now, one last thing I want to highlight. In all the underdog movies that I can think of, there is a moment, at least one moment, if not a couple different times, that the underdog has the ability to give in, to change who they are or to conform to the rest of the group. One of my favorite, all-time favorite underdog movies, bar none, is Rudy. I, I love the movie. I love sports. I love football. And the movie Rudy, it, it, it moves me to tears every time I see it. It's such an amazing, powerful movie. But one of the scenes in, in Rudy that I will never forget, it's always on my mind, is the scene when Rudy is at practice at a Notre Dame football practice. He's finally made the team. He, he's on the practice squad. It's towards the end of the season. It's, the, it's actually the last practice of the season. And Rudy comes around the edge of the, uh, uh, as a defensive end, he comes around the edge and he sacks, or, and he takes out the tailback behind the line of scrimmage. And as he does so, the tailback, who is a, one of the starters for the Notre Dame football team, gets so irate at Rudy. He jumps up, he throws the football at him, he starts screaming at him and yelling at him and cursing at him because he can't believe that Rudy tackled him like this on the last practice of the game. And finally, after they've gotten the two of them away from each other, because they're kind of scuffling a bit and whatnot, the head coach of Notre Dame comes up and he says, what's the problem? And the tailback replies to the coach, it's the last practice of the season. And this guy is playing like it's the Super Bowl." And I love the coach's response because it's priceless. He looks at the tailback in the eyes and he says, you just summed up your entire sorry career in one sentence. If you had a tenth of the heart of Rudy, you would have made all American. Throughout the movie, Rudy is told by players, coaches, friends, and family that he shouldn't go at it as hard as he does, that he should learn some restraint, that he should change. He should change how he's playing the game because clearly he doesn't have the talent. Clearly he doesn't have the strength or the agility or the speed or anything else that would make him a great football player. But in the end, it's his perseverance that's why he, that is why he is still the only Notre Dame football player to have been carried off the field in triumph. In the story with David and Saul, uh, with David and Goliath, Saul gives David all of his armor, his sword and his shield. And on a, I, I don't want to say anything negative about Saul here. I think Saul was trying to do the best thing that he could. He saw the childishness of David. Yes, he saw the faith. So at the very least, he was able to willingly say, okay, I'll let you go do this. But anyone in their right mind has got to see the difference between Goliath and David. And so Saul, wanting to give David everything he can, he gives him all of his stuff, his armor, his helmet, his shield, his sword, all the best stuff. Because let's face it, Saul is king. All of his stuff is the best that Israel can make. And he gives it all to David wishing to give this poor child everything that he could to help mitigate the substantial difference between the two fighters.
But David, David knows that God called him without the shield, without the armor, and without the sword. God called him when he was simply David the shepherd boy. You see, David knew who he was in God. And he gives all that stuff up because it's not me. He says, that's not how I'm going to do it. That's not how God's wanting this done. Thank you very much, but that's not how God's supposed to do it. David was fearless in front of Goliath because of his faith. David was humble about everything, continuing to say, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. God's going to do it. Why? Because of his faith. David was comfortable being who he was. Say it with me. Because of his faith in God. We too need to learn how to be fearless, how to be humble, and how to live in our own skin. And here's where it starts. It starts with having the faith to let God lead us wherever he wills us to go. And having the faith to know that he will take care of everything if we just say yes. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks that you continue to call us. Help us to get out of our own ways. Help us to have the faith to step out in your calling, just as we are, with what you have given to us, to face the giants of this world, knowing that there is nothing, nothing in this world that is bigger or greater than you are. And so long as we are with you, there is nothing this world can overcome us with. For we will always have you. We pray all this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I enjoy being here with you on our YouTube channel. If you haven't done so already, hit the subscribe button down below the video. Like the video as well. It's a great evangelistic tool because every like helps to push the video out to more people so they can see and hear the word of God preached to them through the YouTube channels. I hope and pray that you have a healthy and a safe week. And I look forward to the next time we meet, whether it be in person or here on our YouTube channel. May God bless you until the next time we get to worship and fellowship together. <laughs>